Thank you very much, Hanno. Can you hear me loud and clear? Uh, yes, you can. Great. You. All right. So first of all, thanks a lot for inviting us. Uh, we're very excited to present at OFM. Uh, and uh, the title of this paper is Barriers to Global Capital Allocation. As uh, Hanno mentioned, uh, Enrico and Roman uh, are also joining us uh, uh, today. So um, the, uh, the research question that we want to address with this paper is fairly straightforward. Uh, one, uh, we want to ask what are the factors that impede cross-border investment? And two, uh, can we somehow quantify their impact in terms of cross-country capital misallocation? So to answer this question, we do a number of things. First, we do some theory. Uh, uh, I'm going to present a novel multi-country dynamic general equilibrium model of foreign investment. And you're going to see that this uh, uh, model uh, produces a structural gravity equation for bilateral investment positions between countries. Uh, then we're going to do some empirics. Um, uh, we're going to go and estimate this gravity equation uh, or various flavors of it. And we're going to use the estimates to calibrate our model. Uh, we, our model can be uh, powered with different uh, uh, barriers. Uh, our benchmark specification has four variables uh, capturing barrier to foreign investment, which are geographic distance, cultural distance, foreign taxation and political risk. And you're going to see that these four barriers are going to capture a good deal of uh, variation in foreign uh, investment. And then we're going to go and take the model to the data. Um, so what we find is that when we take the model to the data, our model predicts uh, out of sample uh, a significant home bias, high rates of return to capital in emerging markets, as well as upstream capital flows. I'm going to define that in a second. So a number of realistic features of our model. And finally, we're going to use our model to do counterfactuals. So um, we basically ask uh, if we were to remove all of these barriers impeding cross-border investments, how much world GDP will we be able to recover? We find that uh, the loss in world GDP uh, due to these barriers is about 7%. More interestingly, we also find that these uh, that are highly heterogeneous effects across countries uh, with, being, with important implications for cross-country inequality. Now, of course, uh, there is a, uh, we build on an extensive literature. So uh, there is a long history of using gravity equation that started in trade uh, and then uh, also spilled over into international finance. Now, uh, there is also a, a big literature investigating the determinants of foreign investment as well as uh, potential barriers. And we also connect to that. Now, there's some recent, uh, very interesting work uh, uh, done also by some of the organizers of these seminars uh, uh, that uh, uh, studied the uh, asset demand systems in international finance. Uh, our, uh, you will see that our model has an, a demand system for international assets. Uh, it's not going to be as uh, elaborate as some of these, but we, we have a basic one. It's so we're also connecting to this literature. Um, and because we study capital misallocation across country, of course, we link also to the capital misallocation literature. And uh, we also broadly, we also link to the literature uh, uh, studying cross-country differences in income. Now, where our paper fits in is uh, what we uh, what we argue to we are we are proposing is the first multi-country uh, structural gravity model of foreign investment broadly defined. Uh, you will see it's a highly tractable model. And what can we do with this model? We can do two things. The first is to try and rationalize. Uh, a number of uh, puzzles or stylized factor that we know from the international finance literature. For example, we have the gravity empirical regularity. Um, uh, we're going to talk about home bias. Um, we're also going to speak to differences in, uh, uh, in returns to capital and capital per employee across countries. Now, another thing our model produces is gross, uh, uh, gross flows. So most, uh, most traditional model only produce net flows of capital between countries. Our model is actually uh, producing uh, 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 German investors investing in the United States, as well as US investors investing in the Germany at the same time. So capital flows uh, uh, both ways. And finally, uh, you will see that our paper also speaks a little bit to the Lucas puzzle. Famously, uh, uh, Bob Lucas in a 1990 paper observed the capital does not seem to flow from rich to poor countries as a traditional neoclassical model will predict, but rather the other way around. And so you're going to see that we uh, can speak also a little bit to that. And the second thing we can do with this model is to do counterfactuals. We're going to be able to quantify capital misallocation worldwide and also link it uh, to, more importantly, we're going to be able to link it to specific geopolitical factors. Okay. 
So this is our contribution. Uh, if there's no question, I'm gonna dive straight uh, into the model. Okay, so this is a multi-country model. Uh, so uh, we're gonna have n different countries and I'm gonna use the following convention. I'm gonna denote uh, uh, usually the destination country, the one that uses the capital uh, with the subscript I. And I'm gonna use the subscript J uh, to denote the, uh, the country that supplies the capital. So the country where the investors are located. Now, each of these countries I is gonna have a representative firm that produces a homogeneous uh, tradable numerator good that can be either consumed or reinvested as next period of capital. We're gonna assume full depreciation, so no differences between stocks and flows. And in addition, each of these countries is gonna have a fixed endowment of labor, which we assume to be immobile. So the idea is that capital can move across countries, but labor cannot. And all of these uh, uh, representative firms are gonna use a Cope Douglas production function. So uh, Y is the output, omega is the uh, total factor for activity, capital is, uh, uh, is K, labor is L, and there's gonna be a, uh, a country specific elasticity parameter uh, theta. And this is uh, what the aggregate, uh, the global resource constraint uh, looks like. Total output at time T has to be equal to current period consumption uh, summed across all the different countries uh, plus the next period of capital. Now on the production side, we're only gonna make a little non-standard tweak. Uh, we're gonna assume that production uh, takes place inside these entities that we call plants uh, that are all costless to build and they commission. So we're gonna use X uh, as, the, um, as the identifier of a generic plant. Uh, and each of these plants holds a kappa units of capital. Okay, so what that means is practice is that uh, plants are simply a discretization of the capital, an integer version of the capital stock. Uh, so nothing too, nothing too uh, weird here. There's a qu clarification question from Zhen Yang. Is there only one of most ge uh, genius uh, that serves as consumption good and capital across countries? Yes, there is. Now, um, the uh, return to capital, uh, we denote by R, it's denoted as, uh, it's, um, and it's determined as usual, and the W is gonna be the wage rate, okay? Now, um, these, uh, all of these countries are populated by a, a continuum of agents. So this is an overlapping generation model. So we're gonna assume that every period T in each country J, there's a continuum of agents. Uh, we are gonna use a Z to denote a generic agent. Uh, Z is between zero and one. These agents are born and they live for two periods. We're gonna use a, a CT of Z to denote uh, the consumption at time T of a generic agent Z. And this is what their utility looks like. It's basically a Cobb Douglas of their, uh, um, of their consumption when they're young and their consumption when they're uh, old. Now, uh, each of these agents, uh, again, we generically call them Z, uh, are endowed with LJ labor units, which are easy, uh, inelastically supplied. J, remember, is the origin country, is the country where these investors are located. So in period one, so when they are young, they work and they save a part of their labor earnings, uh, which are given by WL. And we're gonna allow them to invest these savings potentially abroad. Um, in the second period, when they're old, uh, they're gonna live from their capital returns, okay? Now, uh, in this model, we're gonna look at a steady state equilibrium. So the utility above is gonna give us a very simple saving rule. So each of these agents Z uh, is gonna save uh, uh, a fixed proportion of their labor earnings, which is given by alpha, okay? Now, next, uh, this is the interesting new part of our model. Everything else is pretty standard. Um, uh, let's study how these uh, agents allocate uh, uh, capital across countries. So uh, remember that each of these agencies is, is atomistic. So they have their own little atom of capital that can invest uh, in one plant that can be located anywhere in each of these N countries. How do they choose this plant? They're gonna choose the plant that offers the highest subjective return. We're gonna denote uh, the subjective return specific to XZ. Remember, X is the plant, Z is the investor. Uh, we call the, obje the subjective return uppercase R. Now, why, is why are these uh, returns subjective? 
they are subjective because we assume that asset markets are imperfectly intermediated. There's going to be an intermediating agent that collects a, next, uh, a net foreign investment fee, uh, which we uh, denote by lambda. And this uh, lambda is going to vary at the plant investor level, XZ. Now, in addition, the destination country I is going to be able to impose a, a discriminatory tax against the, the investors of country J, which denote this tax by tau IJ. And you should think about this tax uh, relatively broad. It includes both uh, actual taxation, but it can also include uh, uh, expropriation risk. So it can also capture political risk. Uh, now, and this is the equation that links uh, the subjective return to capital to the objective return on capital. So uppercase R X of Z is going to be equal to uh, the objective return Ri times two things. The first is the one minus the, uh, the taxation rate, tau Ij. Um, and the other thing is going, that is going to multiply this is going to be uh, e, to the, e to the minus power of lambda. So this is the multiplicative investment fee. Okay. And uh, we're going to put some structure on lambda. We're going to assume that it's made up of three linear components. Uh, the first component, uh, dij times beta, uh, is uh, basically this is a vector of distances. Okay, so we're going to make uh, this intermediation cost depend on some multidimensional vector of distances uh, between countries. Why is it multidimensional? Why is it a vector? Because we're going to allow it to depend not only on geographic distance, but also on uh, other measures of distance, such as cultural distance. Now, the second component, so this is varies at the IJ level, okay? So it's systematic across countries. The second component, uh, which we call Xi, which varies at the investor plant level, uh, is instead uh, randomly uh, drawn from an extreme value type one distribution. So this one is random. And the third and last component is going to be a rebate, which we call G of, uh, uh, of J. Uh, and uh, basically, what this, uh, the way that this G is determined is to make sure that these uh, uh, in the intermediating agents make uh, uh, zero profit. Okay, so if you're wondering how this differs uh, from uh, a trade setting with iceberg cost, uh, iceberg costs basically uh, are gonna, in some sense, uh, destroy uh, uh, goods, okay? In this case, uh, these uh, distortions do not destroy capital. They work more like a redistributionary taxation. So there's a question from Chen C. We can defer this to discussion, but why is political risk written as a bilateral measure uh, rather than a country J measure. So, uh, it, so tau IJ is not just political risk, it's also uh, discriminatory taxation. And we're going to have a bilateral measure because, uh, and here's why, because uh, there are, um, uh, there are uh, dual taxation treaties between countries, which can affect the, uh, the level of tax, the tax rate at the, IJ, uh, at the IJ level. I'm going to show you later on how we measure that. Okay, so there's a Q&A question. So Praveen is asking, does this distant capture information cost? Excellent question. So this is basically, yes, it's uh, consistent with a, uh, with a long literature in international finance, the way that we, uh, that we uh, uh, interpret this distant measure as capturing uh, information asymmetries, including uh, uh, monitoring uh, uh, and search costs. So yes, the answer is yes. Now, uh, OK, so the nice thing is that we can actually aggregate in a very tractable way the portfolio choices of all of these individual investors. And uh, uh, by doing so, we obtain the portfolio shares, which we call sigma ij. So what is sigma ij? This is basically the share of the portfolio hold collectively by investors in country j that is invested in the destination country i. Okay, so and it has a fairly intuitive expression. So the proportion of assets invested in country I from investor in country J depends on what? It depends uh, depends negatively on the uh, on the this bilateral tax uh, tau IJ. It depends positively on the objective rate of return in country I. It depends positively on the size of country I as captured by its capital stock. And it depends negatively on distances, on this uh, multidimensional metric of distance D. Uh, 
okay? So it's pretty intuitive. And if, uh, in case you haven't noticed yet, this uh, should remind you of the uh, trade share equation from uh, the Econ Eton cartoon model. And uh, now the next thing we can do is we can rearrange this equation to obtain the dollar asset uh, position of country J in country I, which we denote by AIJ. And what we find is that uh, this, uh, this asset position obeys a gravity equation. Uh, what that means is that uh, uh, it depends uh, positively on uh, the GDP of the destination country. So it's proportional, sorry, to the uh, GDP of the destination country. It's also proportional to the GDP of the origin country, J, and it's inversely proportional uh, to this uh, uh, multidimensional metric of distance. So uh, it's called gravity because it reminds the equation for Newtonian gravity. Now, uh, the next thing we do is we, uh, we prove a theoretical result. Uh, I like to call it a dual efficiency theorem uh, because uh, uh, what we basically show is that uh, the absence of uh, frictions to international investment translates in an efficient uh, allocation of capital from a production standpoint. So just to be clear, we say that capital is efficiently allocated uh, if there's no way to reshuffle capital from one country to another, leaving the global capital stock fixed without increasing uh, uh, world GDP. So we call the world capital stock uppercase K and the world GDP uh, uppercase Y. So what we prove is the following proposition. Uh, the following uh, three uh, uh, statements are equivalent. So each of them is true if and only if each of the other two statements are true, provided that companies and investors are optimizing. So the first statement is the capital is efficiently allocated. The second equivalent statement is the rates of return are equalized across countries. So our I does not depend on I. And the third equivalent statement is that asset markets are zero gravity, meaning there's, there's no distortions coming from uh, distortionary taxation, uh, nor from, uh, 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 from distances. Note that we are actually still allowing for these idiosyncratic distortions to be in place, okay? So you can still have the idiosyncratic distortion and capital can still be efficiently allocated. And a uh, uh, corollary that comes with this is that uh, uh, provided that investors are optimizing and asset markets are at zero gravity, then you have that all countries uh, J should invest in identical destination country portfolio. What that means is that sigma IJ, the portfolio share, should not depend on J, the origin country. So uh, Japanese investors uh, invest in similar sh portfolio shares as do American or German investors. Uh, so in practice, uh, if there are no uh, frictions to international investment, uh, you should observe, uh, uh, you shouldn't observe any home bias, okay? So it's kind of like a, a CAPM type of result. Now, the, here's a u another useful uh, theoretical result. Uh, this is also based on previous work by uh, Bakay and Fari. Um, so turns out that uh, uh, we can actually approximate uh, the world GDP loss uh, uh, from uh, international investment frictions using uh, uh, the dispersion of rates of return to capital. Uh, so this is basically, you take uh, an efficient equilibrium where rates of return are all the same uh, within the same country. Uh, you take a, a second order Taylor approximation around this efficient equilibrium and you have uh, the basically, uh, this is the, uh, 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 the approximation for the uh, percentage GDP loss. And if you study this uh, equation carefully, you will see that it's basically like a, a weighted measure of variance in log, uh, in log uh, returns across countries. Uh, and it's approximately GDP weighted, okay? Now, this is important, this result. Uh, I'm, the reason I'm showing it to you because it has an important message uh, that uh, for our model to be able to uh, appropriately capture capital misallocation across countries, it needs to be able to uh, produce a meaningful variation in rates of return across countries. And I'm gonna speak to that in a minute, okay? So these rates of return are gonna be somewhat important. Okay, so this is all for the, uh, for the model. So let me get into uh, the empirics if there are no questions. Bruno, can I ask you a question about this? Sure. If you go back one slide, to, just to make sure I understand we're, we're sort of quantifying output losses here compared to a hypothetical world in which um, there are no 
uh, gravity related types of uh, frictions like um, you know cultural distance all these frictions you were referring to we're all setting those to zero yes and i see okay so so start from an efficient degree so if it's efficient we have seen from the theorem before rates of return should be equalized across countries right so you right, but your, your notion of efficiency here, you, you're going back to a world in which, in some sense, you're almost changing the environment because you're kind of assuming that these like cultural frictions are, are gone in some sense. Yes. Yeah. Just so this only works to a second order approximation around an efficient equilibrium. This is important. Got it. Also, okay, if thanks. I can jump in, Hanno, I think we also have in mind that the effect of these frictions goes to zero. Not we're not really thinking of a world where there's no distance. We're thinking of a, a world in which you can uh, eliminate the monitoring costs and the information frictions that come from distance. Got it. Okay. Thanks for clarifying. Yes, that's a uh, that's the interpretation of these. Uh, you know, of room in some sense, and what an efficient equilibrium looks like. Okay. So, okay. So, any other questions? Otherwise, I'm gonna get into uh, the empirics. Oh, there's, uh, there's one question maybe that you could take here if you have a second. So there's a, a question from Chen Yu, um, who's wondering about the distri distributional assumptions in order of magnitude of the frictions um, that are uh, that you're sort of using here. Um, I don't know if you could comment on that. Uh, so, you can defer until later. If you... Sure. I think uh, if it's, uh, I mean, uh, the idiosyncratic one, we mentioned they are extreme value type one distributed. This is a pretty standard assumption. The other ones we're going to measure. So I don't know exactly what distribution they follow, but we're going to try and measure them directly. OK. OK, so next, uh, let's talk about the empirics. Uh, so in order to take this model to the data, we have to estimate this gravity equation. Uh, and, uh, uh, and we're going to estimate it using some data that I'm sure some of the, uh, the uh, attendants of this seminar are familiar with. So we try and use the best available uh, data. Uh, we have some, uh, uh, there's these two nice papers uh, uh, that have basically uh, taken IMF data on foreign direct investment and foreign portfolio investment and have restated them from a residency to a nationality basis. So what that means is that if you look at, inter, you know, at international investment uh, uh, data, you will see that there's a lot of investment going to uh, countries like Cayman Islands, uh, Bermuda, basically tax havens. And so what these two papers did using some very uh, granular microdata, they have basically reallocated investment across countries to correct for the presence of uh, uh, tax havens. So and we use this uh, newly developed data. Now, uh, the, what we do is we compute the foreign equity asset and foreign debt assets. Uh, uh, in the, uh, and basically we run our baseline regressions on asset, total assets, then equity, and then debt. You will see that it doesn't really make, a, we get more or less, pretty, pretty much the same coefficients, regardless of which uh, ec, uh, asset class we're looking at. We use also the FDI, FBI breakdown in the appendix, although here you have to be a bit more careful because the way that, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the F, uh, IMF uh, allocates uh, international investment between uh, foreign direct investment and foreign portfolio investment is somewhat arbitrary and has been criticized in the literature. So we do it, but we do it in the appendix. And we also do robustness by using the unrestated, so the residency based data in the appendix. Turns out that uh, basically none of this uh, makes a big difference for, for our coefficients. Our coefficients are always very uh, uh, robust to all of these different uh, data formattings. Now, in terms of the explanatory variables, uh, the first and most important one perhaps is geographic distance. Uh, this is basically just the population weighted uh, geodesic distance between countries. The second one comes from a uh, you know, uh, lot of previous work by Enrico and Roman. Uh, it's a measure of cultural distance uh, and it's based on the world value survey. So two countries are defined to be culturally distant from each other if the respondents uh, to the WVS from, the, from those countries respond in a very different way uh, to uh, WDS questions. Um, now, the, uh, and then let's talk about taxes and expropriation risk. This should go to the, uh, back to the question of uh, Chen C. So this one minus tau uh, friction, uh, we basically break it down in two parts. The first one, one, one minus tau K. This is gonna be the actual tax, uh, the bilateral investment tax between country I and country J. 
We're, I'm going to tell you in a second how we measure that. The second part, and as you anticipated, is uh, varies at the country I level. This is the pro, uh, this is the expropriation risk. Is the probability of uh, expropriation? How do we measure these two components? Uh, the first one, tau k. Uh, this is a we measure it using withholding rates. So you might know that a lot of the previous papers in the gravity uh, finance literature use the uh, double taxation treaties uh, as an explanatory variable. Uh, for this paper, we will actually be able to get something even better than that. Uh, we went to, to the IFDB uh, database, the one where usually dual taxation treaty data comes from, and we were able to obtain a, a treaty adjusted withholding rates. So these are bilateral tax rates that account they take into account whether there is a, um, a, a double taxation treaty between country I and country J. And uh, with regard to pi, the probability of expropriation, uh, we uh, basically, um, uh, we use uh, previous estimates from a very nice paper by Alfa, Klem, Lioskan, and Volosovic. Um, and uh, uh, basically what they do in this paper, they take the, they estimate the same elasticity of uh, foreign investment uh, with respect to some measure of political risk. The, in particular, the one from the International Country Risk Group so what we do is we take this measure of political risk, which is very used in the literature, and we use their estimates to convert it basically into uh, a rate of expropriation, okay? So this uh, uh, we calibrate entirely uh, from using the data from this paper. Okay, so these two basically, uh, we, we met this, uh, this part, one minus star ij, we measure it directly, we just have to plug it into the model. We still are left with one moving part, Oh, Matteo is asking, uh, excellent question. Uh, are there tax rates for corporate tax, capital gains, dividends? So we use a uh, withholding tax rate on interest and dividend income. Uh, if you look at the paper, there's actually a lot of manipulation. Basically, we take an average of the two. Uh, uh, we use, uh, um, and we also have need to have a, um, a methodology to account for the fact that there might be different uh, uh, tax brackets. So uh, basically, it's a, what we use is a composite measure of all of these uh, different withholding tax rate on both interest and dividend. Okay. So uh, yeah, so what is left to measure is beta, the same elasticity of uh, uh, a foreign investment with respect uh, to geographic and cultural distance. So how, uh, and so basically that's the only thing that we basically have to, uh, to get to calibrate our model. Everything else we either get from the data or is, uh, or is already identified. And so to get uh, beta, we run a regressions. Um, uh, we start from an OLS regression or log uh, foreign investment uh, on both uh, cultural and uh, geographic, um, uh, cultural and geographic distance. We then do uh, a pseudo Poisson regression. Uh, so this is a type of regression that also gives you a semi-elasticity for the coefficient the difference is that it allows you to include the zeros in the data, which you could, cannot do with a log regression. Uh, it doesn't really make a big difference for us. There are not that many observations with zeros. Um, now the regression framework also allow us to throw in a bunch of control variables. We collected a ton of those. We have uh, a control variable for anything related to colonial history. Uh, linguistic distance, a variety of geography and trade policy controls, trade cost, uh, currency peg, et cetera, et cetera. Now, uh, and so basically our, our, our coefficients are usually uh, are uh, always robust to the inclusion of all of these uh, uh, control variables. Now there's still one uh, potential problem, uh, which is uh, uh, related to identification. So you might argue, okay, uh, you guys are running regressions of foreign investment on cultural distance. But it could be the case that perhaps the two countries that do a lot of business with each other, they become closer culturally, okay? So there's potentially a reverse causation going from foreign investment uh, to uh, cultural distance. So to address that, we also have an instrumental variable specification where we uh, instrument cultural distance uh, with the following two measures. The first one is a measure uh, 
of ancestral distance. Uh, this basically tells you how long to populate, how long ago in centuries two populations diverge. And it, uh, it's estimated from so-called genetic microsatellite data, looking at basically at the neutral mutation in the DNA that are not subject uh, to uh, natural selection. And uh, the second one is a measure of religious distance. So you construct a family tree of uh, religions uh, and uh, you can compute a measure of distance between religions and uh, you also and then you weight them uh, uh, by population uh, to obtain country to country uh, measures of uh, religious distance. Okay, so uh, I'm actually not going to show you the regression. You can look at the paper, but long story short, uh, these two variables, uh, uh, they're always uh, very strongly uh, statistically and economically significant to give you, uh, I think it's much easier to give you uh, an idea of the economic importance of these variables by just taking the model to the data directly. Also for, uh, uh, in terms of timing, uh, it's gonna be better. Um, so, so next we take the model to the data. Uh, so we collected a lot of variables, but uh, 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 thankfully we, you know, we can still cover a big proportion of world GDP uh, when we take the model to the data. So we our model has 70 countries, uh, and those countries make up about 92% of world GDP in 2017. So we have pretty decent uh, uh, coverage in terms of data. Okay, so uh, the first thing we want to make sure is that we sort of replicate uh, important features of the data. Uh, so what I'm showing here is uh, 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 measures of capital stock per employee in a scatter plot. So each of, these, uh, uh, each of the observation is one country. On the horizontal axis, I'm showing the capital stock per employee that comes out from our model, okay? Uh, we, uh, we don't feed any measure of capital to the model, by the way. And on the vertical axis, uh, we show the capital stock per employee that, uh, that comes from Penworth tables, okay? Uh, and no, uh, of course, we, ma uh, we managed to, uh, uh, to match that pretty well. That is not entirely surprising because, again, we are, we are uh, calibrating our model using regressions of foreign investment data, which, of course, is strongly related to capital stock. But still, it's nice to see that we are able to do a good job matching those. Now, here is a much less uh, obvious result. Um, so these are rates of return. On the horizontal axis, uh, you have the rates of return that our model spits out. So you take our model to the data, it's gonna spit, we don't feed any returns data. Sp the model spits out the rates of return. And uh, on the vertical axis, we have uh, uh, rate estimates of the rate of return that come from another paper. This is a very nice paper by David Harrickson and Simonovska. Uh, and what they do in this paper, they estimate the rate of return using our accounting procedure. Now, uh, you know, and our rates of return are able, this is entirely out of, uh, you know, out of sample, non-targeted, sorry. Uh, we are able to uh, get a correlation of 0.6 almost uh, uh, with these independently estimated rates of return. Now, uh, I argue that this is one of our strongest results for the following reason. If you remember the dual efficiency theorem, remember that if we were to shut down distance uh, uh, taxes expropriation risk, uh, our model will give you absolutely no variation in rates of return on capital. So the entire uh, variation along the horizontal axis, so the rates of return from our model, comes entirely from these four variables, okay? And so using only these four variables, we're able to already do a re reasonably good job of matching external data on rates of return, okay? Why is this important? Remember that the, rate, the dispersion of rates of return is gonna be related to capital misallocation. So we need to be able to do this if we want to capture capital misallocation, okay? Now, next, uh, so yeah, the other thing that comes out of our model is that rates of return uh, are predicted to correlate negatively with uh, GDP per employee. So this is, uh, again, rates of return are from our model are plotted on the uh, vertical axis and GDP per employee in logs is on the horizontal axis. And as you can see, there's a strong negative relationship between the two. And uh, long story short, basically uh, emerging markets are uh, predicted to have higher rates of return uh, uh, as a consequence of these uh, as a consequence of these barriers. So next, what I'm showing, let's talk about home bias. So uh, what I'm showing you in this uh, in this table is uh, basically the portfolio shares for the G20 countries. 
the investor country, J, are, or, are the columns. The destination countries, uh, I, are the uh, other rows. So the columns sum up to 100%. Now, remember that for, uh, to estimate our regressions, we only used the foreign investment data. So we didn't have any data on domestic investment. So basically, this is a, the diagonal uh, elements are the shares of domestic investment uh, predicted completely out of sample by our model. Now, despite not having any re domestic return data, we're able to produce uh, um, uh, a, whole, a degree of home bias uh, that in terms of magnitude is consist consistent with what has been documented separately in the literature. So this is another realistic feature of the, uh, uh, of the data that our model is able to uh, reproduce. Now, uh, and this is a result that I was unaware of until a while ago. There is this nice paper by Lau, and Ji, and Zhang uh, that documents a, a strong, a robust, positive relationship between uh, the degree of home bias uh, in, uh, uh, in international investment by country and the rate of return on capital. And uh, uh, basically, home bias is defined as the log deviation of the domestic share, uh, dom domestic investment share, and uh, uh, the domestic share of global capital. And we find uh, uh, that our model produces a, a strong positive relationship between uh, this measure of home bias and the rates of return on capital. So another stylized fact that our model is able to, uh, to, uh, to capture. Bruno, just to clarify on this slide, on the previous slide, when you talk about home bias and in, in foreign investment, you're only talking about FDI on the, the shares uh, no, this is, here, so, this, or this is? Excellent question. So the when we take our model to the data, there is a, a we basically we throw away all of the foreign investment data because our model produces by itself what in foreign investment should be. Remember those uh, uh, the uh, uh, those um, uh, portfolio share depend on the distance, depend on the returns, uh, and so the, those are all. And uh, I mean, the distances are general, but the returns are endogenously determined, and so uh, all of this comes out of our model. Oh, and this as well, both the home bias and the rates of they come out entirely of our model. We are not seeing any uh, foreign direct investment or foreign portfolio investment. We only use FDI, FDA data to basically get the betas. And once we have the betas, we don't need those anymore to uh, to take the model to the data. So this is to, this is total foreign investment. That's what I should be thinking about when you yeah, show these foreign, pictures. In the context in the context of our model, where there is no in our model, there is no difference between uh, uh, FDI, FDI, or equity or debt investment. So in some this is total investment in the model. Does that make okay, sense? Thanks. Yeah. There and, is and also the, the betas are estimated from. Uh, data that is the closest to that definition, meaning the sum of FDI or F and FPI, or alternatively, the sum of debt and equity. Yeah. Okay. So Parveen is asking, I, uh, can I get your view about the real exchange rate volatility? Foreign investment is more risky relative to home because of real exchange rate. So uh, we, uh, of course, this is a model without, excellent question, this is a model without currency, but we actually have a robustness check uh, or not more than our bus, it's a, an extension of the model where we try and take uh, currencies into account. I'm gonna talk uh, about it at the very end of the talk. So just bear, bear with me uh, a few minutes. Uh, okay, so next, uh, uh, ah, okay. So one more thing that we might want to look at is uh, net flows. So uh, what I'm showing here on the vertical axis is a net foreign asset uh, uh, divided by GDP. So this tells you whether a country is a net investor or a net receiver of capital. And then plotting that against uh, uh, the GDP per employee in logs. So this is basically uh, uh, as, per, as reproduced by your model is basically the look of puzzle that, uh, that poor countries tend to be net investors uh, while rich countries tend to be net receivers of capital. So, ca so capital seems to flow upstream. Okay, so... Uh, Next, uh, let's, uh, let's do some counterfactuals. We're almost out of time, but we should be making it. Um, so the first and most obvious counterfactual you might want to do is uh, what happens to world GDP if you remove all of these barriers to international investment? We find that world GDP in a zero gravity world uh, will rise by about seven percentage points. 
Now, uh, we, you can do additional counterfactual. So starting from a zero gravity world, we try and reintroduce each of these barriers individually to try and get an idea of how much each of those is important. Uh, I'm just going to summarize the, uh, what comes out for you. Uh, so we find that most of the GDP effect comes from culture and geographic distance. Uh, but political risk and taxes still have a large effect at the country level in terms of inequality. And I'm going to explain what I mean by that in the next uh, uh, slide. And we do all of these counterfactual with both a fixed capital stock and an endogenous capital stock. So our, in our model, capital stock at the world level and at the country level is endogenous. So we also do counterfactuals where we keep a capital, the global capital stock uh, fixed. Okay, so this is about, these are the country level sort of inequality result. So what I'm showing here in this graph uh, the light, so on the horizontal axis is the log capital per employee. So the light blue area is the distribution of uh, the cross section of the cross country distribution of capital employee in the observed equilibrium, which is distorted by all of these, uh, uh, by all of these frictions. So light blue area is the observed, the observed distorted equilibrium. The, dot, the dotted black line shows you what happens uh, to the distribution of capital stock when we remove these barriers. You find that capital stock uh, uh, re uh, reallocates itself in a much more uniform way across countries, okay? And these are direct consequences for GDP per employee. You find that uh, you can actually look at the same picture for GDP per employee, and you find again, a big reduction in dispersion in GDP per employee when you remove all of these barriers. So the dispersion of capital in per employee goes down by 70%, no, 80% uh, when you remove all of the barriers. And the one of GDP per employee goes down by 40%. So there are big, uh, there are significant implications for cross-country inequality. Now, why does this happen? It happens because uh, when you go and look at which countries get reallocated more capital when you go to zero gravity, uh, I'm showing that on the vertical axis, you find that, that the countries that get reallocated more capital tend to be poorer countries, countries that start from a low level of capital or, or GDP per employee. Countries that lose capital, on the other hand, tend to be capital rich countries. So, and this is the reason why you observe this big reduction in inequality. Uh, and uh, uh, another uh, aspect of this is the, uh, it's the net flows. So here I'm showing the the same picture as before, net foreign asset divided by GDP uh, against uh, log GDP per employee, but I'm taking uh, net foreign asset uh, divided by GDP in the zero gravity counterfactual. And as you can see, the relationship between net foreign asset position and GDP flips when you uh, go to zero gravity. So now the rich countries become the net providers of capital and the poor countries become the net receivers of capital. Uh, uh, so, and this is why in some sense, we're also be able to uh, talk a little bit about the Lucas puzzle. Okay, so uh, I mentioned a couple of uh, uh, extensions of Robasa. I'm almost out of time, so I'm gonna go very quick. So we have uh, an extension of the model where we, uh, we deal with capital controls uh, using uh, uh, IMF data from uh, the RR publication. This model has basically an addition of tax. Um, we also try and account for currency. So this is a model without currency. But what we can do is to try and account for um, currency hedging costs. So if you invest abroad and hedge uh, your foreign exchange risk, what you basically have to give up or you receive, depending on what the forward premium is, is the forward premium on the currency pair. And so we basically are able to insert the, uh, we take, uh, we estimate forward premium from Bloomberg or Trading Economics and put it as an additional uh, investment cost in the, um, inside the Lambda, the, the international intermediation cost. And finally, we also have, a, uh, we have an extension of the model where we make the country level returns risky. And we basically were able to calibrate that using the equity volatility indices, uh, indices as a proxy for country level risk. Long story short, none of our results are uh, significantly affected by any of these additional uh, extensions. Okay, so basically I'm out of time, 15, 51 minutes. So I'm quickly gonna conclude. So what I've done today is to present a new uh, dynamic general equilibrium model of international investment uh, that produces a structural gravity equation for bilateral investment uh, uh, positions. We have estimated this gravity equation using uh, some new data 
uh, on foreign in, uh, direct and portfolio investment. And our estimates suggest that cultural, geographic, and policy barriers exert a major influence on the network of international investment. Uh, we find that overall our model fits the data quite well and helps make sense of several empirical facts about international investment. We find the large effect in terms of global capital allocation, the world GDP loss due to capital misallocation about seven percentage points. And we also find the highly heterogeneous effects across countries uh, with significant implications for cross country inequality. And with that, I basically run out of time. So I wanna thank you uh, very much for your attention. And uh, you know, we can uh, take additional questions. Okay, thanks uh, for an excellent presentation, Bruno. This was uh, super clear, I wanna, um encourage the participants to uh, use the um, Q&A or chat function to ask questions or they can raise their hands and I'll, I'll kick off uh, the uh, Q&A session. So one thing I was thinking about was it seems like if there's uh, a large cultural distance between two potential um, uh, countries that where one could invest in the other country, it, it, it seems like if, if you're going the uh, route of buying securities uh, issued by that country rather than doing foreign direct investment, that, that ought to help you somehow maybe uh, mitigate the, the cost of cultural distance, right? If you compare that to foreign direct investment. Uh, is, is that something you've thought about in the, in the context of your, of your model? Um, yeah, so uh, I mean, the, our, as you know, that model does not have a different that distinction between FDI and FDI. Somewhat surprisingly, when we ran the regressions with FDI data and FDI, we found a, a relatively close coefficient on cultural distance. Uh, I have to say, we, it wasn't entirely expected, but that's what we found. So yeah, that's surprising, uh, right? Because you think that the cultural distance would be very relevant when you're talking about foreign direct investment, but perhaps less so when you know, a mutual fund manager in France is thinking about investing in Colombia and buying Colombian stocks, for example. Yeah, if, I, if, if, I, if I may comment on that, you know, that, that's, in fact, we, we were thinking exactly along those lines. A possibility is that the data about FDI are not exactly, you know, good enough to tell us that, you know, to, to, to give us a distinction between FDI and FDI as it should be, because there are some conventions uh, about what is the percentage of control and so on. Maybe if we had more precise measures of actual FDI versus FPI, maybe we would get you know, uh, some different results in the coefficient. So maybe it's more about the way that FDI is measured versus FPI than what reality is about. That, that, that's a possible interpretation of the results. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Enrico. So Matteo has a question, right? So before I go to my question, yeah, I think Enrico is right that you know there is a suspicion that FDI is now masking not only a lot of tax shenanigans but also a lot of portfolio flows because of the way multinationals um, organize themselves and transfer capital across borders. So I think it's you know the traditional image of FDI as in I'm coming to your country and building a plant. It's it's there in the data. But it, it might or might not be the dominant force of the FDI totals as they are reported. Um, my question uh, was um, similar um, in, in some sense, in the sense that it has to do with how you treat the data. So if you sum up global imbalances, you don't get to zero. So they, they should be zero, but they're not worldwide. Uh, there's a large residual um, in, in total net foreign asset balances. And I'm wondering, uh, where you stick that in your data, uh, because you're one of, the, one of the few exercises that looks at the entire global distribution uh, and something um, sort of trying to figure out how that affects the results. It, it's quite big. Uh, it's excellent, not a small result. Uh, excellent question. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, when we take our model to the data by the construction, there is no residual because uh, we take the foreign investment day FBI and FBI, we basically, uh, we, we throw it away once we have the betas. They are all, we only use it up to the point where we have the betas. Uh, now the uh, uh, the uh, the original data of the FBI still has these uh, big residuals. Can we say something? Uh, 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 can our model say something about that? I uh, I uh, I am not entirely sure. We we will like it will depend. I mean, it will uh, we capture about so the correlation of our foreign uh, uh, investment position is about uh, 0.6. So. Is it large enough to be able to say that our model is able to reconcile what is uh, resid like uh, the reason for the zero? I don't think it is. So, um, I mean, 
it will be interesting to some, probably probably something that we can think a bit more about uh, at this stage. I, I I have I don't know. I don't think there are model has gives any insight on the reason for why this residual is there. I mean, at a minimum, you could try to look. So first of all, I I really appreciate the answer. It's quite transparent, uh, and I think you're you're being suitably cautious. Um, but one thing that you could look at is, in some sense, which countries are off the regression line in your model. And then whether there is any reason to believe that the countries that are off the regression line might be misreporting. I mean, there's a literature on this missing wealth. And you know, that gives an idea of which countries might be off the regression line because of misreporting. It'd be interesting if there's anything uh, in your model that resembles that. Yeah, no, that, that, that's a great suggestion. In fact, we were a bit um, uh, interested in the fact that, that one of the countries, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that is off the regression is China, which is you know, very big uh, in, you know, also you know, quantitatively. And so, so may, there might be, you know, that's a great suggestion. No, thank you, Matteo, that I think uh, uh, looking at the outliers. You know. So there is actually a question for the floor that ties in very well. Have you considered the implication of, a, of your model for tax competition? This actually is related to Matteo's question in the following way. Turns out, so actually, uh, there is a, uh, we worked out an extension of the model that allows countries to invest uh, indirectly. So using uh, uh, basically to invest in two steps uh, uh, into, a, uh, uh, into a third country. And uh, uh, Yes, uh, that extension of the model it could be interesting to study tax competition. It could also perhaps uh, fit the data even a little bit better. Like it, it allows you to capture both these, uh, the residency-based position as well as the nationality-based position. And perhaps uh, that can shed additional light on which countries are, uh, uh, um, are um, misreporting. So uh, yeah, I think this is sort of like we're starting, we're only, uh, getting started on this research agenda, and there is a lot more that we can do to uh, to study these uh, questions. Okay, great. Thank you, uh, Bruno. I think that addresses Martin's question, but if he has a follow-up question, uh, he can let us know, and then I'll go to Zen Yang. Yeah. Uh, Zen Yang, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, thanks. Um, a quick question first about the model um, and about how this is mapped to the data. So how do you think about the difference between a country's wealth versus its size, say capital or otherwise, um, because in the data we can see that some countries have more wealth than its size and some countries have less. Uh, how is this handled in the model? Okay, so in the model we have uh, uh, S is the savings, okay, and those are basically a proportion of GDP, and then we have a K, which is the capital stock, which instead comes from uh, uh, from uh, from a bunch of other countries. So there is a difference there, and those difference in uh, uh, in uh, uh, in level terms uh, that is going to give you the net foreign asset position, right? Uh, I guess if you take it in ratio, it's going to give uh, it give you something that is uh, uh, more akin to what you're looking for. You're looking for the ratio of uh, uh, wealth uh, um, uh, to uh, capital to wealth, right? Is that what you were mentioning? Yeah. Yeah, we don't show it in the in we don't we don't have any figures unfortunately, but we could actually plot to tell you which countries have a high uh, ratio of uh, capital to wealth with respect to um, uh, to others. It's a, in some sense it's a different way to show the net foreign asset position of a country. Okay, and I would like to ask one one quick additional question, um, Bruno, about uh, the sort of the intuition for how your model kind of um, sort of attacks the uh, Lucas puzzle, right? So mm -hmm. is, is the intuition that uh, in, in the real world, capital doesn't flow to poor countries because they, they're they just most mostly uh, culturally and geographically uh, distant? Um, is that the main driving force from, from other countries? Um, yeah, quantitatively? Yeah. It's la largely. And it also taxes and political risk play a role, but it's uh, the, you know, the lion's share comes from culture and geographic distance. Yeah, and so one thing, one thing that you said intrigued me. So I, I thought that uh, um, risk per se would also play an important role, but, but you're saying that when you think about return risk, that, that that really doesn't move the needle very much in terms of explaining, um, explaining the dispersion in, in rates of return, right? That was kind of, you went over that quickly. That was one of the uh, 
yeah, extensions to VPN. Make, I want to put a caveat here because we have yes. a, we like a, we have a sort of a very simple like we uh, risk in our model is just an extension and it's a very uh, how can I say. Uh, uh, very simplified the treatment of risk. We don't have, uh, we don't take into account basically the betas of different uh, countries. Uh, if you, if that's what you're looking for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, and so uh, now I think a, a nice next step in this literature will be to combine this framework that we have with something like uh, akin to what uh, uh, David Harris and Simonovsk have in there. I don't know if you know that paper. Yes, they that's the paper I was thinking of. Yes, they yes. basically look at uh, betas that, uh, and I think uh, in some sense it would be nice to marry a, a paper with where countries have different betas, where there are right. also barriers to capital allocation. And actually, to that point, uh, yeah. you can actually see uh, you can take the rates of return computed by uh, Debbie Eriks and Simonovska, and you can compute using the Taylor approximation for like, the world GDP loss. Okay, so yeah. basically we uh, we cut like uh, it's like 15, 16 percent. So we capture half of it, meaning that there's still like uh, so we capture a lot, but not all. But not right. everything. Uh, yes, of course. So right. there's still a lot of space for differences in beta. So I think that the as an even more like uh, the next step is to put both, uh, 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 you know, uh, countries yes. with different betas and as well as in imperfections. That makes that makes perfect sense. Well, great. Um, oh, I, think, um, I had a question. Uh, unless there are other questions, ah, Gen Z has another question. Yeah, yes, uh, this is super interesting. Um, the You went over the part with the instrument super fast, but I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that, uh, just because I've never seen that instrument be used before and how to think about it um, in a bilateral way, um, as opposed to thinking about it as sort of some deep primitive preferences um, that differ. About, uh, the instrumental variables. Okay. Yes, the IV. Yeah. So. Um, uh, Want me to get that, Bruno? Yes, please. Uh, the, this is uh, like this is a uh, uh, Rico and Romance uh, territory. So, <laughs> uh, I yield. So we have done a lot of work on trying to trace um, where do contemporary differences in people's values, cultures, norms, etc., come from, and. Um, one of the uh, uh, exogenous factors that matters to explain bilateral differences in contemporary culture seems to be ancestral distance between populations, which you can capture many ways. You could look at linguistic distance, for example, which we prefer to not use as, as an instrument because it might be, it might still have contemporary effects. It's, it's not purely exogenous or things that are far in the past. Uh, like uh, you know this what we call ancestral distance, which is really a measure of uh, genetic distance between populations based on only traits that um, uh, change over time in a neutral way, not a selected way. And um, the idea is that if populations have been apart for a long time, meaning they have not inter intermixed, etc., they've developed, they've drifted apart culturally, uh, you know, uh, in parallel with drifting apart. Uh, uh, genetically. And we found in past work that the first stage of this is quite strong. So everything is bilateral. You're looking at matching populations to countries, and there's various ways to do it. And, uh, and, uh, and the first stage is very strong. So, you know, the, this sort of the, the populations that answer different questions on the World Values Survey differently also have been apart longer. Uh, and, uh, and yeah. That's true. Controlling for physical distance too. Yeah. Like physical distance still doesn't. Okay, there's still. Yeah, uh, we Enrico and I in the past have written many papers on this um, uh, controlling for geography in in various ways, not just simple distance, but also looking at microgeographic features like mountain ranges and uh, uh, you know being separated by seas, etc. And yeah, it's it's really uh, a, a pretty robust result. It's not. Huge quantitatively, it's not like you can predict all of the answer, you know. But but you but the correlation is between the distances is positive and very significant and and sizable in magnitude uh, without being overwhelming. Yeah. So just just what you want for a first also, stage. You don't want to uh, you know you yeah. don't want a perfect first stage. But yeah. yeah I, I should I, also add that, that there is a mod, uh, um, basically a, uh, a mini model of uh, of the relationship between yeah. culture and uh, ancestral distance in the appendix of the paper. Yeah, yeah. So, I was, yeah, um, was going to mention that, 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 that model can give you a little bit of an intuition. It's highly simplified, but give you a little bit of the intuition of why if you, um, a, a, a lot depends on sort of uh, 
understanding these ancestral distances and molecular clock that really tells you how far you have to go until you find common ancestor. So, and then uh, there are a lot of um, cultural features so that are also transmitted quite randomly. So, you know, what kind of different feature and you can, um, and you can link the two um, theoretically and then in the empirics, as Roman said, you know, find a lot of support, but it's very important to use uh, you know, measures at this as a distance that you can, you know, reasonably exclude, uh, you know, in terms of direct effects, because it, it, this microsatellite data is really pretty much junk DNA that doesn't do much at the end, you know, so it's not that would have any kind of effects on other traits, uh, cultural, otherwise, uh, that, you know, would should influence any kind of contemporary behavior. Religious, yeah. of course, is a little bit different because, but again, this religious distance is not as much your beliefs, but the genealogy of your religion and how far you have to go until you had the same religion. So if you're a Protestant, I mean, a Baptist uh, and a Catholic uh, would go back uh, to the 16th century, but the Greek Orthodox and the Catholic would go back uh, to the 11th century. So it's, again, it's a the genealogical idea that, you know, we use as an instrument, you know, as, a, as an identification strategy. Okay. Thank you. So okay, there's thanks. one more question from the floor. Should I take it, Anu? Yes, please do. Uh, we can actually ask uh, Chen Yu to, to ask the question directly if, um, if... Um... Oh, hi. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, no. so uh, I just make uh, this uh, comment about whether we should also include bilateral trade flows in the regression because uh, trade and finance are closely tied and also trade is influenced heavily by the gravity barriers. So maybe you can um, uh, have the two channels simultaneously in the regression to control for some of the bias. And um, in addition to that, maybe in the theory section, you can also uh, include bilateral trade costs um, because there are many papers in international finance that have talked about the effects of trade flows on financial flows. Uh, so this is just uh, my, I don't know, tiny suggestion on this. Yeah, Thank so you. we uh, so we basically, so trade, uh, trade flows are, in, uh, are endogenous in this model, but what we do is we, we basically were able to collect a, a measure of trade cost that actually comes from a trade gravity model. And so we were able to control for that in the regression. So that's uh, the measure one. The second measure you suggested is one of our, uh, our control variables in the in the regression. Um, Wensi, do you also did you also have a question? Yeah. So right. I have a question which is a bit like a follow up question to Hanno's question. So if we think about the four barriers that you emphasize in the paper, I mean, except maybe for like the taxation or capital control each measure, they're relatively like static, right? Whereas if we think about the global capital allocation, oftentimes it would link it to a very dynamic global financial cycles, right? I mean, when the global risk aversion is high, for instance, you have less flows into emerging markets. So for issues that speaks more to the cycles, I wonder if you have any perspective or have ways for the model to accommodate maybe as future work. So, um, yeah, so what happens is, so you, like you mentioned different things, you mentioned uh, uh, both uh, uh, the, uh, the, risk, uh, uh, the risk, the global risk cycle, uh, so uh, one of that's, yeah, like uh, I do not have uh, right now an extension of the model where there is a, a risk uh, as we usually try and, uh, and capture it in, uh, in uh, macro financial models, so, but I, it's one of the things I think to, uh, to work on next. So uh, with respect to stuff like uh, uh, capital controls and how some of these have changed over time. So uh, I, I um, uh, so in terms of uh, capturing how capital controls have evolved over time, here we are really limited by the data. So some of these uh, FDI and FPI data is only available for the last few, um, uh, for the last few years. Uh, geography and cultural distances are by definition uh, static as variables. Uh, but there is, a, there's actually, uh, I actually have another project that is really in the preliminary stage where we actually want to look at uh, um, uh, at how uh, um, uh, basically the long-term effect of capital controls, like, like uh, starting at least from the 80s. And we will have to do a, a few things regarding data collection there. Uh, but yes, the, it is like, a, that's something that we are thinking to look at. 
Okay, I think we have one more question from uh, Chen Zi. Um, yeah, so following up on what Winston was saying about how there would be time variation as institutions change. Um, one of the things you mentioned in the talk was that uh, ultimately we should think of these frictions as like monitoring frictions, right? Like of, you know, you there's some uncertainty or some losses that, um, and so I was wondering if, um, you know, there are regulatory changes or, you know, technological changes that you would expect that would, ex you know, decrease these monetary monitoring co costs in a bilateral way, which maybe are recent enough in to fit in the scope of your data to think about, um, you know, what, uh, like just uh, sizing those up. So, uh, so you can think of a, like, like in terms of policies that reduce uh, not the, you know, the, the cultural distance, but the effect of cultural distance. Uh, there's already some of those, like you think uh, in broad terms of a policy, like for example, the Erasmus program in the EU, uh, stuff that fibers exchange between countries. Uh, there is some already some of that going on in terms of trying to uh, um, uh, to remedy the effects of cultural distance. If you think about the geographic distance uh, and you take a very long-term perspective, uh, migration could be something that goes in the direction of, of reducing the as information asymmetries uh, um, uh, related to geographic distance. So these are two examples. So again, we are not when we do when we go to zero gravity, we are not really thinking about uh, reducing the actual uh, geographic culture, but just uh, basically uh, to uh, certain policy that act as some sort of like counter wedges that neutralize right. the effect of these frictions. So yeah, these are two examples, but of course you can come up with more. Uh, as, as, you, as, you, as you mentioned technology, what we are doing right now, right? With these webinars, you know, the, maybe the, 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 the natural experiment of the pandemic will tell us something about the effects of these technologies, so, you know, in reducing the effects of geography and maybe even culture. Because there's been a lot of work on whether the internet or social media would reduce cultural distance across countries. And of course they can go either way, you know, and they can even uh, exacerbate because when we do these things online or not in person, you know, we might end up uh, diverging, you know, in some, in some, you know, in, instead of converging. So this would be very interesting, but, but clearly this is a direction for research that would be, you know, very important to explore. What are the policies that would allow us uh, to reduce the effects of these barriers without reducing cultural distance in the first place, which we do not want, right? We don't want to have a cultural homogeneity or everybody thinking the same way. That would not be the right way to go. And we should also remember that there are country fixed effects in the model that might, where you know, some cultural diversity might matter for innovation and other aspects. So it's not that mm -hmm. reducing cultural distance would necessarily be beneficial in welfare terms because there are other things that you know, we are you know, keeping you know, as, as given that might be important. Great, thanks, thanks, Enrico. I'd, I'd like to conclude by by thanking Bruno for for really great presentation, fascinating paper, and I want to also thank, thank uh, Romain and Enrico for for answering questions. Uh, this is really uh, fascinating stuff. Thanks so much, and uh, um, hope you can join us next time for the OFM sem seminar. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely.